Okay, Matthew chapter 18, verse, uh, begin in verse 1 there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read. Uh, we, we, we started this text last week. Let me just go ahead and read the verses, and then we'll, we'll get going. It says, uh, Matthew 18, chapter, one, I mean, chapter 18, verse 1, it says, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Now, I, I'm going to be frank with you. I struggled today in my studies. I have not, Sometimes it's like that. I couldn't get my mind uh, clear. Has anybody taken that medicine you see advertised in Areva? Anybody try? I, I, I took 12 of them this evening. So, <laughs> No, I actually went and bought some of that stuff with the intent because there's times I can't seem to get my head just, you know, the, the function that, the way I need it to. And so I've been seeing this advertised, went and spent 40 bucks, got a month's supply. It better work, I'm telling you. Uh, but I only took one. So we'll see how that goes. But really, I had a struggle with this, so bear with me. Uh, it's not a complex lesson. It's just one of those days, and so I'll do the best I can with the Lord's help in response uh, to the ongoing struggle that the uh, disciples seem to be having amongst themselves, that selfish desire to elevate themselves or have some sort of approval of Jesus that they would be elevated in the kingdom. Uh, in response to that uh, and the question that they ask in verse 1, Jesus seizes this opportunity and uh, uh, to further teach his disciples just what the kingdom uh, of heaven is like and why humility and childlike faith is going to be, uh, that's going to cause them to do well in the kingdom or not do well, okay? And so he calls this little child, we saw this last week, he calls this little child over to him. And according to the parallel passage that, uh, that, that, that we find in Mark chapter 9, verse 36 says, not only did he call him over to him, but Mark 9, 36 says he put him up, he took him into his arms, okay? So this is a little guy, uh, a toddler perhaps, and, and uh, Jesus calls him to him. And then he says these words, again, verse 3, he says, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, the word converted there simply means to turn or to turn around. Uh, it, it really, the idea of conversion or in, this, in, in this particular uh, word is, uh, is, is to do an about face or to, to go a whole other direction. Okay, and it, it carries the same idea with it as the word repentance does. We're familiar with the word repentance. It means to turn, but repentance is turning from something turning from sin when you repent of your sin and walking away from something that's ungodly. That would be repentance of sin. Conversion has the same idea, but it's not necessarily turning away from something, but it's turning to something. And what is it we're turning to when we're converted to Christ? We're turning to the things of God. We're turning to things that are right and godly. And so the two go hand in hand, repentance and conversion. And uh, with one, we turn from our sins, and the other, we turn to the Savior. And so they, kinda, they kind of uh, uh, work together there. And it's, it's the beginning of uh, when, when, when we have turned to Jesus, turned from our sins, and turned to Jesus, we're taking steps that are similar to what he's trying to teach them here about childlike faith. Because these, these, he's, uh, uh, what he's getting across, trying to get across to them is how desirable it is for, his child, for him to see his children act as though they were children. Now, it's kind of a little bit paradoxical for you and I because, because when you think about it, we're always really trying to get, striving to grow up, right? We're saying, we hear somebody being immature and we say, why don't you grow up? Or, or you're, you're being so immature or, or uh, at your age. We use these terms because it is that our desire is to, to kind of get past our immaturities, okay? On the other hand, it's different when you're walking with God because God is really telling us here in this text, 
or God's word is, is that he is looking for those childlike traits. He's looking for things that you find in children. Only it's different in the sense of, of what he's looking for as far as childlike faith is, is things like being trusting. You know how a little kid is just trusting. You say, man, don't, don't look behind that curtain. There's a, there, you know, there's, a, there's a dog back there. Well, first thing you know, they trust you. That there's probably a dog back there. You can say anything to them almost when they're little guys, okay? And they're just trusting and they're dependent. They, they, they totally are looking to you for everything. And they're, they're, they're believing. If you, if you, if you sow a, a, a story to them, they'll buy it hook, line, and sinker. They'll just believe everything you say. And, and they're unpretentious, and they're, they're, they're uh, unassuming, and they're without ambition. Now, that's when they're real little guys. They're without ambition. They're, they're willing to follow. They're, they're naive. All of these are traits that God is really saying he wants to see in us as his children. And, and these are things that please him. He goes on in verse 4 and says, whosoever, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. He's talking about the little guy that he's had in his arms, okay? The same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The word humble here, in this, when he says humble himself, it simply means to make low. That's really what it gets, boils down to is God expects to see us take the same position at his feet as this little child that he just has brought into his lap and to his arms has done. To just, just be totally yielding, trusting, submissive, and just come into his arms and let him, uh, let him be great. And let us just trust in his greatness. No, no claims. You know, the little child is not trying, he's not trying to impress anybody by going into Jesus' arms. He really hadn't even thought about that. He's not, he, he's, he's not trying to gain anything by going to Jesus' arms personally, anything particular. He's just trust in Jesus and walked into his arms. And, and he's just submitting himself uh, to to. To Jesus, and that's what He's really trying to drive home to us that He wants us to do. We, all of us here, at at, at some point, uh, well, we've all been children, and most of us here have raised children. And we're around children, and we we understand that that a child rel relies upon their parents for everything. And again, when we start getting it as they get older, we understand there's some resistance and there's some some uh, uh, ind uh, independent ways that are not not desirable and this sort of thing but when they're real little like this little one he's just brought into his lap when a child is hungry what do they do they let their parents know that they're hungry and then what do they do they just wait now they may wait in tears but they're they know that this person here fed me last time and the time before and the time before and the time before so dinner's coming and again, they may do it in an immature way, and they may whine, and they may cry while they're waiting, but they know when they've let their parent know, either through tears or through words, if they're talking, they have let their parent know that they need nourishment, and it's coming, okay? And they wait upon it, okay? But they're doing, they're doing it dependently. I know this person is going to deliver what they are supposed to deliver to me. They're doing it anticipating that the provision is going to come through. And that's something that we miss as children of God because so often, though Jesus has come through time and time again, though he's always delivered, he's always been there, he's never ceased to be there for us, sometimes we panic and we lose sight of that and we, we, we lack that childlike trust, okay? And so that's the kind of faith that God is looking for and that's the kind of faith that makes one great in the kingdom of heaven, as he says there in this text. Now, verse 5, he goes on to say, And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Now, still holding this little child in his arms, Jesus shifts a little bit in his teaching, and he turns kind of to a, a different lesson. Verse 3 and 4, he's dealing with the person, uh, the, uh, the need for childlike faith in his children, okay? Now in verse 5, he's dealing with how we approach one of his little children, those that belong to him. If you're a parent uh, here this evening, you know that what I'm about to say is true. We want the best for our children, right? 
every parent does, okay? I mean, it would be a, a, a psychotic person with, with mental problems to not want what's best for their children, okay? We all want what's best for our children. And so the result of that is, is when our children are doing bad, we're sad. And when our children are doing good, we're happy. And as, it, as it's been said many times, usually we're only as happy as our unhappiest child. When someone or something brings negative into your child's life, we're indignant about it, right? Even our adult children, we, we hang on to that, and there's, there's a certain amount of, 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 of good to that still. But when somebody brings something bad into our child's life, we automatically, we're in defense of our child, and we're indignant to who or, or, or what it is that's brought that bad into their life. On the other hand, when someone blesses our children, someone helps them, we have the highest praise for that person or that group. In other words, the enemies of our children are our enemies, and the friends of our kids are very well thought of and appreciated. And it should be that way, okay? Well, think about this. God is the perfect model of parenthood. He's deeply concerned about how you and I are treated as his children deeply concerned and as a father he keeps a very close eye out for his little ones and as he expresses in this verse he watches and considers how his little ones are being treat, uh, treated okay the basic meaning here is treat one of my children with with kindness and you're treating me with kindness that's what Jesus is saying treat one of these little guys well and you're doing the same as treating me well, okay? He says there, whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. That, 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 that phrase, shall receive, means to take someone to yourself. In other words, take it upon yourself to care for them. It's a term that was often used in hospitality being shown to someone uh, an honored guest into our home. In other words, we take them in and we care for them. We, we roll out the red carpet. We give them what their needs are while they're in our home. And, and with special care and, and kindness is extended to that person because we esteem them highly enough to have them in our home to start with. And, and for a meal or whatever, we just we do everything it is that, that, that is necessary to, 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 to care for that person, okay? That's the idea that's expressed here. Uh, and, and, and the Lord's point in this verse is that, that child, his children are so important to him that he monitors how they're treated. And so how you and I treat another believer is really watched by Jesus. And it really puts, when you think about this and you look at it, uh, get past the surface of what's being said here, is even though we're Christians and we're children that are being looked like that after as well, He's also paying attention how we treat one another. In other words, it's, it's, it's not just us on the playground that's being watched. It's how, it, it's, it's how others are being treated by us that's being watched as well, okay? So our behavior is it's just so important. Uh, let me go ahead and go to verse 6, and this is where I kind of had to struggle uh, bridging the gap here, moving to this. It says, Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believeth in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Okay, so, so Jesus uh, uh, now is kind of shifting a little bit. He's, he's showing the other side of the coin, if you will. In, in, in verse 5, he's saying, if you treat one of these little guys well, then you're just the same as treating me well, okay? And now he's shifted and he's simply basically saying, you mistreat a child of mine. And it's the same as mistreating me. Obviously, the abuse of children, okay, is, is wrong on any level. Children and literal little children, okay. But he's not, when he says little ones here, he's not referring to little children. He's referring to his children, okay. So don't be mistaken about it. Again, it, 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 it's always in our best interest to look out for children in general, okay, and have great concern for protection and care of them all the time as well. But the point here, he's talking about his children. Some of his children are 80, 90 years old, okay, but they're still his children. And so he makes it clear that 
in, in verse 6 with these words that he, let me read it once again. He said, whosoever shall offend one of these little ones. You know what that word offend simply means? It means to be a stumbling block. Whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, it were better that a millstone be hanged about his neck and that he were thrown into the depths of the sea. That's some pretty serious stuff he's saying there, okay? If, if you are to attack one of God's children, you're the same as he's saying attacking him. If you're to do kindness to one of his children, you're doing the same as, as doing kindness to him. But here's another meeting that we don't think about. When you think about the term shall offend and being a stumbling block, he's not necessarily talking about being mean to another child of God. He's not talking about necessarily being unkind and these sort of things, but he's implying causing them to stumble or fall. Did you know I could be your good friend or considered your good friend and not be mean to you but cause you to stumble and fall? Why? With my influence. If I say, even as a pastor here, as a, I would tend to have some spiritual influence on the people of the flock. If I treated all of you guys well but led you down the wrong path biblically, what would I be causing you to do? Stumble. I'd be causing an offense, leading you astray and this sort of thing. So this makes it clear. It goes beyond uh, coming against Christians with the intent of harm, but the offense can be just as simple as influencing someone in a negative way and causing them to sin. See, a person doesn't have to be an enemy in order for us to cause them uh, harm. We can cause them spiritual harm just simply with our negative uh, uh, examples. Maybe conducting our lives in an irresponsible way with no evil intent, but our example causes somebody who looks up to us to do the wrong thing and follow our lead in doing so, and we've caused them an offense. We've caused them to stumble. And so um, uh, it, it's, it's a really a very serious issue here. And when you look at the terminology that Jesus uses here in verse 6, it's really pretty, it's pretty sobering when you think about it because he speaks of, it, it, he's saying you would be better off if a millstone were hung about your neck and you were thrown into the depths of the sea. That's pretty serious stuff. He's saying you would be better off dead than being an offense to one of my children. Pretty serious, okay? The imagery here is that of, uh, of being intentionally drowned, okay? The Romans had a knack for coming up with some of the cruelest methods of execution known to man. They were just good at it. That's why crucifixion was so uh, popular uh, during the Roman rule, okay? They literally sometimes practiced this, what we're reading about here. They would take a condemned criminal and secure a very heavy stone around their neck, and they would drop them off the side of ships and execute them in that way. And uh, Jesus adds emphasis to that by referring to a millstone being tied about uh, their neck. Now, a millstone, if you're not familiar with a millstone or maybe have, have, have read about it, but it was uh, they, they uh, were giant stones weighing hundreds of pounds that were used in grinding mills, uh, one stone against another stone, and they... Uh, that a, a mule or a, 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 an ox would would be tied to that that, that stone, and the stone would spin, and it would they would put the grain in there, and it would grind the grain into flour, and it was it was a milling process. Okay, uh, that that's what a millstone was, is one of those giant stones, and so obviously, a hundreds of pounds weight millstone would not be used to drown somebody off the side of the ship. Jesus uses this really is just kind of overkill. It would be an impractical thing for somebody to take that big a stone and hang about the neck of, of a person and, and execute them that way. They just didn't do that, okay? But he emphasized, he uses that emphasis to just drive home the seriousness of being a stumbling block to those that are around them, being a source of offense, being being a negative example or a negative influence or these sort of things. And and so it's it's really sobering when you think about how many eyes, especially as adults and the young Christians that are coming up under us and, and our grandchildren and our children and stuff, uh, there's there's I won't go into all the issues, but there's been issues and conversations I've had with people about particular habits in their life that they say, well, you can't show me in the Bible where that's wrong. And, and I said, well, you're right. 
I can't show you where it's black and white says that's wrong, but I can show you where it tells if, if you get along with it fine and the next person is watching you and they can't get along with it and they get addicted to it and they become full-blown ruined, then you've been a stumbling block to them. That's why I caution you about this, okay? And I've had those talks before. Um, and, and it goes for all of us. It's, not, it, 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 it's for every Christian. There are people watching us, and we could easily be an offense, not even in being in, uh, intently mean to someone or anything else, but be an offense simply by the fact that we don't conduct ourselves with as a good example to them, and they follow our lead, okay? This is, this is how I come up with this lesson, and again, I stumbled through it, but we got through it, and so I'm going to keep trying the Nareva. Maybe, maybe that's the answer to my preaching right there. So we'll go ahead and uh, stand and be dismissed in word of prayer. I hope you guys will plan on uh, coming to the, the Christmas banquet. Guys, it'll be so much fun. Bring somebody with you. Bring a covered dish. Uh, if, you, if you can bring a little extra, that would be great in case we do have some guests that show up without, uh, without a potluck meal. Uh, uh, or uh, 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 a dish, uh, then uh, then we'll have plenty. Okay. All right. Let's be dismissed. Word of prayer. And Jeffrey.